Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the SIIEE KwaZulu Natal Center's webinar on Etiquini's Independent Power Producer Procurement Program. Before we start, a few webinar considerations. Attendees are reminded to ensure the volume is turned up on your device. Ensure you have a stable internet connection. This will ensure the streaming and audio will run smoothly. Attendees can ask questions via the questions panel located within the GoToWebinar control panel. And by default, the control panel is located on the right-hand side of your screen. The chat function is reserved for webinar organizers and panelists to communicate with attendees. Attendees will not be able to chat with each other, however, are encouraged to ask questions. A recording of this webinar will be made available on the SAIEE YouTube channel, SAIEE TV, under the KZN Center playlist. This channel is updated regularly, so ensure you check back as often as possible for new uploads. You will find a registration link in the chat box. Please click on that and register to receive future updates for, of, of new uploads. A certificate of attendance will be issued a few weeks after this webinar, once we have received the CPD validation number from EXA. I'd like to now introduce you to our host today, uh, Mr. Shepard Nkosi, the Chairman of SIE Cuisine and Natal Centre. He holds an MSc Engineering degree in Electrical Engineering from UKZN, a post degree in Sustainability with University of Southern Queensland, Australia, and a post degree in Project Management with the University of Stellenbosch. During his 23 years in the built environment, he has completed several certificates, including the certificates in System Engineering Management from WITS, Lean Six Sigma, and Certified Energy Management. As I mentioned, he's the chairperson of the SIE at KwaZulu Natal Center and vice president of the Durban University of Technology Advisory Board. And he's also an advisory panel member of the UKZN and is professionally registered with EXA. Over to you, Shepard. Thank you, thank you, Miss um, Afrobus, and uh, apologies to our attendees and a warm welcome to everyone this afternoon. Due to connectivity, I'm uh, out of the country and um, my connectivity is challenging me a bit today, so I will be switching off uh, my webcam uh, cam, and most of the speakers as well, I think due to also load shedding, we will better a bit to have our cameras on and I'm sure you look forward to our theme for this afternoon. But with me, I have uh, Dr. Rob uh, Steven, who will be one of the panelists and will be uh, assisting with the question and the answer session. And um, Dr. Uh, Rob Steven was born in Joburg, South Africa, and he holds um, a BSc as well as um, MSc and MBA degrees, and as well as a PhD in overhead line design. He retired from ESCOM on 31 Jan 2020, where he held the position of the master specialist in the technology group responsible for distribution and transmission and technology of all voltage covering both AC and DC. He was responsible for the smart grid uh, strategy for ESCOM and uh, he's the past uh, chairman of uh, Secret Study Committee B2 on overhead lines and has held positions in SIGRI of um, special uh, reporter and working group chairperson or chairman and uh, has um, authored over 100 technical papers and uh, he was an international president of uh, SIGRI uh, from 2016 to 2020. He is a fellow of uh, the South African Institute of uh, Electrical Engineers and uh, was uh, also awarded the President Award in 2016. He is currently a specialist uh, academic advisory at uh, the University of uh, Wazulu Natal at Devon. And thank you, Dr. Um, Stephen. I think we look forward to partnering with you uh, later during um, uh, the, the session. And uh, the theme for this uh, afternoon, uh, we have um, our member from Metequini, uh, Mr. Sbu Njalinchali, and uh, you might have noticed this afternoon we'll be discuss discussing the Etequini Independent Power um, Producer Procurement uh, Program. And uh, who is Mr. Sbu? And Mr. Mr. Sbu is our key uh, uh, presenter this afternoon, and uh, he will be taking us through this uh, theme as I've presented the theme. 
So Cebu is um, responsible for energy sector transformation policy, procurement of new generation capacity and implementation of uh, strategic uh, reforms uh, in the liquid uh, fuel industry. He has been uh, instrumental in driving the regional hydrogen strategy, working with var uh, various officials um, within the Etequini municipality. So Mr. Njalinjali uh, graduated with a BTEC degree in chemical uh, engineering from uh, the Mangosutu University of Technology, a postgraduate uh, diploma in project management from uh, Mencosa, and an MBA uh, from the University of uh, South uh, Queensland, Australia. I'm sure we all cannot wait. I think the timing for your topic, Mr. Sbu, will never be perfect than, uh, you know, being done this week where we're going through load shedding. And uh, the independent power producer uh, program, we all looking forward to hear from you, um, Sibu. And I would like to hand over to you and the platform is yours. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, uh, Shepard, um, for those welcoming remarks. Um, hopefully, everyone can see my presentation. If, if anyone can confirm, please. Yes, that's perfect. Thank you. Um, uh, greetings, ladies and gentlemen. Indeed, it's afternoon in South Africa. Um, we are very much happy and very much excited to share our Etegwini Municipal Independent Power Producer Program and Program. My name is Munjali Njali. I'm from Etegwini Energy Office within the Tegwini municipality. And as, as, as Shepard was saying, I am responsible for the energy sector transformation policy that also included the procurement of new generation capacity. And to a certain extent, I'm also looking at some key strategic intervention within the hydrogen economy. So as part of this presentation today, we would like to take you through to our broader um, provincial outlook in as far as the energy generation capacity is concerned within the energy sector. But I will also talk about the strategic direction of the Tegwini municipality in as far as the energy sector is concerned. There seems to be a very um, changing um, energy landscape in the country right now. And as a result of that, the municipality is actually looking at changing its own business model in order to cater for the development of new generation capacity um, in South Africa. We will also talk about the energy transition policy of the municipality and the broader stakeholder engagement that we have done as part of our policy uh, development going forward. And most, uh, most likely, the most important thing um, for today's discussions will be around the energy mix of the municipality as well as the requirements for infrastructure investment. And quite often when we talk about all these developments, we tend to talk more about the generation aspect, nobody talk about the impact on the transmission network, the impact on the distribution network, and hence the gate price to the final customers and consumers. And therefore it will be very important um, for as a Tewini municipality and um, to also look at those um, associated costs as, 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 as it implemented this independent power producer program and program. And our last engagement will be around the social integration as well as the um, the, the timelines, you know, for project rollout. Quite often, you know, the government institutions are often criticized, you know, by having policies and strategies, but fail to implement those policies and strategies. So I think we are at a stage where we believe that we are able to convert all these strategic um, as well as policy interventions into actionable uh, projects so that we can make some changes um, within the energy sector, but most importantly, creating more sustainable jobs um, for the people of KZ10 and restore the energy security um, within the province of Wazul Natal and more particularly um, around South Africa. As Shepard was saying that we are facing the energy crisis at this point in time, and our view is that we should be able to invest more in the new generation capacity in order to deal with the deficit that we are facing at this point in time. So what you see on the screen is a geographical spread of new generation capacity um, in South Africa. We have just split up South Africa in terms of the southern cluster as well as the northern cluster. So we're all familiar with the renewable energy independent power producer program, program um, of, the, of the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy. So it has been one of the very successful programs that we have ever had in the country. 
um, attracting about 200, 200, more than 200 billion rand since its beginning in pit window number one, and we are now in pit window, preparing for pit window number six. And what we have seen is that it has been some projects that has been connected already into the grid. As you can see that the southern cluster is the one that has been benefiting from the RIP program, and more particularly the Northern Cape, because we all know the fact that Northern Cape is one of got you know a very strong irradiation um, you know um, speed for 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 solar PVs, and in the western Western Cape as well, there is a greater um, wind resource as well as in the Eastern Cape. So those are the provinces that has been benefiting over the past bit window one, two, three, and bit window number four. But we are starting to see the shift away from the southern cluster. Um, into the northern cluster. You know, this shift is actually encouraged by the fact that there seems to be a great limitation, um, especially in the northern Cape, and the, we, we are currently see some limitation as well um, in the western Cape as well as the eastern Cape. So now, all of a sudden, the shift for new generation capacity is moving towards the northern cluster. So if you look at our pit window number five of the renewable energy independent power producer program and program, you will see that most of the projects have been located within the Free State Province. This is due to the fact that there is a, a great availability space there. And in fact, the province of KwaZulu Natal, the Bumalanga province, they have got a great capacity of more than 6,000 megawatts. In fact, those provinces um, have not yet actually attracted investment on new generation capacity. And hence, that is why there is a great capacity in those provinces. And our view is that the province of KwaZulu Natal is the one that is not performing very well. And our view is that the biggest um, second economy um, in the country. Um, should not be seen as a as an economy that is not investing in the energy infrastructure um, going forward. So therefore, we hope that all these kind of projects are eventually going to to reach the boundaries of KZN and province in the future. As we see that it is a shift that is actually moving um, from the southern cluster um, into the northern cluster. So our view is that um, the energy security. Um, will, will play a very important role in terms of growing our economy so that we can create more sustainable jobs um, in South Africa. So if you look at the strategic direction of the Tebony municipality, obviously all our strategies and policies are being developed in order to, to, to ensure that there's a proper alignment um, with our provincial growth and development strategy. There's a proper alignment with our national integrated resource plan, proper alignment with our national development plan. So therefore, we work all together with all the spheres of government in order to ensure that we are able to transform the energy sector, not only from the policy perspective, but transforming the energy sector from the research and development as well. Because without research and development, we strongly believe that there won't be any um, you know, modernized um, grid um, infrastructure, which we believe that from the smart grid perspective, um, if one wants to transition towards electric vehicles, we have to ensure that we have a, you know, a smart grid um, that is able to cater for those developments. As you can see that our strategic direction as a Tewini Metropolitan, our view is that by the year 2025, we should reduce our reliance on ASCOM. So by 20%, by meaning that of, of all our electricity, up to 20% of our electricity um, has to come from independent power producers by the year 2025. That is our short-term target. And we should increase that um, target to about 40 to about 40 percent i'm going to 2030 meaning that 40 percent of our electricity um, has to come from independent power producers by the year 2030 and by the year 2050 we should be um, completely um, you know decoupled from the national grid meaning that we'll have to achieve our energy independence as a city of the municipality of which it will be a very difficult exercise but our view is that we've got the capacity within the municipality and we've got the skills and therefore um, we have got to invest more in the new generation. We've got to invest more in the distribution network. We've got to ensure that our distribution network is modernized in order to cater for those developments in the future. But we're also looking at the, 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 the implementing the reforms within the liquid fuel industry. So our view is that the energy sector, not only the power sector is changing, but the entirely the, the, the supply value chain of an energy sector is changing. So transport fuels, as I've already mentioned, it affects the transport transition 
from internal combustion engines to electric vehicles uh, to fuel cell electric vehicles is starting to dominate um, several um, strategic discussions, not only in South Africa, but across the globe. And our view is that we have got to promote the transport transition if we were to decarbonize um, the, the transport sector as a whole. We are also starting to see some industrial transformation within the context of hydrogen economy, and we are also work, working towards achieving you know, the de decarbonization agenda within the industry. That's also include the petrochemical sector, that's include the chemical sector. But our overall goal as outputs is that doing all these strategic reforms, it should result in restoring the energy security within a technical municipality and having IPPs integrated into the mainstream economy of the province of Wazulatan and more particularly um, in Deben so that they can contribute meaningfully to the economic growth of the city. But secondly, is to ensure that we mitigate the impact of load sharing to the local economy by building power generation infrastructure closer to the load centers so that we can minimize the electrical losses. But most importantly, it's about creating that enabling environment so that we can provide policy certainty and increase investor confidence going forward. We have got to ensure that we drive policies that are able to attract investment so that we can build in whatever power generation infrastructure. And that is what uh, our energy transition policy is all about, but we are going to promote the investment of oil and gas and offshore wind along the coast of the municipality in order to adequately respond um, to our oceans economy. And that's what we are currently doing under the transport fuels or under the transport transition, and we are going to increase, obviously, the uptake of electric vehicles and hydrogen-powered cars in the Teguini municipality. As I've already mentioned, that Teguini is already developing the regional hydrogen strategy of which it will be utilized in order to establish the hydrogen hubs within a Teguini municipality as well as Regis Bay. We are working very hard in order to develop the N2 strategic corridor to be the economic hub you know, for the province of Pazuno Natal. Lot and lot of development has been happening around the N3 corridor and we believe that in the future, we should be able to start um, promoting economic activities along the N2. So therefore, the development of our hydrogen strategy or regional strategy has been developed in such a way we are able to integrate the most uh, promising and the fastest growing economies um, within the province of Wazunodal, which is your King Fajoyo district, as well as Etewini district. But obviously, we will be working with the private sector in order to ensure that we are able to deep decarbonize um, the chemical industry, to deep decarbonize the petroleum industry, to deep decarbonize pulp and, pulp and paper, pulp and paper, cement, iron smelters, as well as gas exports. So there's a whole lot of developments that we are currently doing within the Tewini Metropolitan. But for the papers of today's present, presentation, Chair, we would like to talk more about the power sector uh, transformation of which we believe that is relevant um, to the South African Institutes of Electrical Engineers. Chair, if you look at our energy transition policy and our stakeholder engagement that we have done um, since the beginning of 2019, um, we told ourselves that we have got to ensure that we develop the policy that has got the element of inclusivity. And that element of inclusivity is also deals with good governance. And that is why when we are developing our energy transition policy, we needed to ensure that we assess the changing market conditions in the country. And then we begin drafting the policy frameworks that will then be utilized in order to regulate um, the power sector in terms of what to build, when to build, and how to build. We then developed what we call the citywide integrated resource plan, of which it was uh, the first kind of it, uh, it was the first kind um, of its own in South Africa, developed at a city level. We already have a national integrated resource, resource plan, which is well and good, and we believe that you know it, it is not representing some of the energy sources that would have been represented at a city level, things like waste to energy, things like oceans energy. So the Teguini citywide integrated resource plan is a policy document that regulates the power sector in the Teguini municipality. We develop it in line with our energy roadmap as well, talking to our strategic direction and strategic targets of which I've already mentioned, which is 20% by the year 2025, 40% by the year 2030, as well as 100% um, um, by the year 2050, and hence achieving what we call self-sufficient in the Teguini municipality going forward. We then have quite a number of scenario plannings with external stakeholders and internal departments on the suggested 
future energy mix because the energy mix of today is not going to be the same as an energy mix of the future. And we've got to ensure that we actually represent all the energy mix that we think is viable within the context of the Tegwini Metropolitan. And we've engaged with all the key decision makers, um, not only within the Tegwini municipality, but key decision makers within the province of Wazulu Natal. So if you look at our integrated resource plan, together with our energy strategic roadmap, those two documents are called or are classified as policy document. They are in the same level as the, what we call national integrated resource plan, as well as the integrated energy plan. So those two documents are classified as policy um, documents of the municipality. So therefore combined, we call it is an energy transition policy that then regulates what to build, when to build, and, and, and how to build. So we don't just wake up uh, in the morning and decide, you know, what, how many megawatts are we going to build, what sort of determination that are we going to make. So the policy direction of an organization determines in terms of how many megawatts are we going to procure in 2025 and how many megawatts that are we going to procure in 2030. So that energy transition policy was then released into the, into the for public participation process as informed by section 17 of municipal systems act as also informed by section 195e of the constitution of South Africa. We believe that electricity as a product is not only consumed by Etagwini Metropolitan, but it's also consumed by our, our, our customers, it's consumed by industry at large. So whatever strategic reforms that we are doing in the power sector, it must also talk to you know, the customers you know, in terms of whatever changes that we are doing. So that is why we have been very much fair and transparent in terms of developing the energy sector transformation within Etagwini Municipality so that we can comply with section 17 of the Municipal Systems Act. And once we have concluded all our public participation process and the Tegwini Council adopted that energy transition policy, which include, by the way, the procurement plan for new generation capacity, which is also talking to section 120 of MFMA, you will know at this point in time that as municipality, you are regulated by the Municipal Finance Management Act. And in order to enter into a contract, you are limited. You can only enter into a contract up to a period of about three years. So in order to have a division from that um, three-year contract or section 33, you've got to ensure that you seek for a PPP mechanism through section 120 of MFMA. So hence, that's what we have done while we were developing our procurement plan as outlined in our energy transition policy. We have then tested the market. I'm sure most of you are familiar with our RFI that we released last year somehow around September 2021, where we wanted to scan the market and check the availability of investors that are more unwilling to invest within the province of KwaZulu-Natal, or those that are more unwilling to build power generation within the province of KwaZulu-Natal. We are very much um, happy you know, to, 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 to state it clear that um, we have received an overwhelming support through our RFI process, which is 400 megawatts, both locally as well as internationally. And we've made some application for different concurrencies with various de de provincial department as well as national department. And we've presented our procurement plan to the KZN Provincial Executive Council, the PEC, and that procurement plan was adopted by the province of KwaZulu Natal and they've mandated the KZN Treasury as well as COPTA to provide concurrencies. And I'm very much happy to also state that uh, we have since received those concurrencies, you know, from our KZN Provincial Treasury and from our COPTA, because COPTA plays a very important role in any service delivery mechanism that is actually involving any private entity as well as the as well as, as well as the municipality hence they play a very important role because they are the custodian of what we call municipal systems act so therefore getting a concurrence from copta is very important especially if the municipality is going to undertake what we call the external service delivery mechanism so we have since finalized all of those concurrencies we have got an endorsement from our pvc we've got an endorsement from kzn treasury and copta so we are in the process now as i speak of uh, you know um drafting the terms of reference in fact we have finalized the drafting of, uh, of 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 terms of reference for a procurement of transitional advisors because one of the things that we want to develop is that we need to ensure that we have a due diligence and that due 
regions must talk to um, bankability of some of these projects. We have seen quite a number of projects, good projects, but those projects are unable to reach the financial clause, are unable to reach the final investment decision. And therefore, it becomes much more difficult you know, to construct um, any power plant without any financial lenders. So therefore, we are in the process of integrating transitional advisors in five different components. We are also looking at integrating legal advisors because when you draft the power purchase agreement, you know, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a legal document that should be respected. It's a legal document that talks to the contractual arrangements. So therefore, it is very important that you have a, you have a person that comes from the legal background but we are also looking at having a finance advisors that will be working with the municipality primarily to ensure that whomever that is recommended as an independent bidder and we work collectively towards reaching the financial clause. And we are also looking at having some technical advisors that will be working with the municipality in order to ensure that there is a safe integration of power generation facility into our distribution network following the grid code compliance, following the frequency regulation in Asia and all other uh, regulations that are actually governing the integration of power generation facility into our distribution network. And we are in the process of, you know, uh, we are waiting for the outcomes of our treasury reviews and recommendation. As soon as that is actually communicated to the municipality, we will then good to go in terms of releasing our RFP into the market. So all we can say is that all of our uh, our project documentation is currently sitting with our national treasury. So we have made the first attempt in terms of treasury reviews and recommendation. So we are still waiting for the feedback um, of that process. And we are very much optimistic that it, we will release, that we will actually um, receive um, a very good and a positive feedback from national treasury since we already have the concurrence from our KZN provincial treasury. So we are waiting for those outcomes and hopefully um, beginning of October, we will have those outcomes um, going forward. And then we will be in the position, obviously, to start um, working around putting together the tender documentation because there is a whole lot of uh, documents that need to form part of an RFP process. Um, you talk about PPAs, you talk about grid connection agreements, you talk about economic development agreements, you talk about, you know, um, job creation agreements, you talk about PPE agreements, you talk about, you know, um, a whole lot of regulations, radical economic transformation agreements. So we need to begin working around developing all those sets of documents, you know, in order to ensure that we are able to speed up the procurement process and release an RFP into the market. We remain hopeful that we'll be able to release an RFP before the end of this year. If it is not this year, surely it will be in the first quarter of 2023. So if you look at our power generation mixture, and one of the things that we have outlined is that the first principle of our energy transition policy is not to favor or disfavor any kind of technology. You know, our view is that each and every technology has to play a very important role in terms of achieving energy security, in terms of mitigating the impact of load sharing to the local economy, in terms of creating more job opportunities, in terms of contributing to the economic growth of the country. So therefore, we believe that uh, each and every technology has got a role to play in our energy mix. And that is why we believe that um, the first set of targets that we have, uh, the first two projects that we have is, uh, is 400 megawatts that we released into the market last year. Out of that 400 megawatts, we've got 100 megawatts of solar PV, and we've got 300 megawatts um, of CCGT, which is combined cyclic gas turbines. But if you look at holistic energy mix of a turbine municipality, you will see that um, we've got 2% of our energy mix represented by hydropower. You know, and, and, and we are of the view that hydropower is one of the cleanest technologies that we can invest into or is one of the technologies that can behave as a baseload power. And if you travel KZ10, if you travel in Devon, um, there is a falling water in everywhere. You go to Great Inanda Dam, you go to Great Josini Dam, great opportunity, great resources for hydropower. So we are of the view that um, having hydropower as part of our energy mix will play a very important role in terms of energy stability, will play a very important role in terms of having 
um, the economic growth of the province of KwaZulu-Natal. And hence, we have 50 megawatts that is in the planning phase for hydropower. But on top of it, we've got waste to energy, of which is a municipal competency. So therefore, um, we've got a competency to deal with waste and therefore converting that municipal waste into energy is a fantastic opportunity um, for Etiwini municipality. We've got 2% allocated for waste to energy. And of course, 50 megawatts is in the planning, it is in the planning phase. And we've got biomass. You know, if you're familiar with the province of Wazul Natal, we've got quite a number of forests, foreign chips, which can be converted as a feedstock into energy, where they'll talk about sugarcane conversion um, into, into energy. So therefore, for a biomass project, biomass to power will then play a very important role in our energy mix. And therefore, we've got about 110 megawatts um, that we have allocated for biomass, and we've got 7% megawatts or 7% um, of allocation for solar PV, um, which is 200 megawatts in the planning phase. Of that 200 megawatts, 100 megawatts is already in the procurement pipeline. So it's already sitting with National Treasury. So it's not a project that is still at a very early stage. It's a project that is fast graduating. As a result of that, um, we're just waiting for those Treasury views and recommendation before, before we can release an RFP into the market. So out of 200 megawatts, that is allocated for solar PV. We've got about 100 megawatts that is already in the procurement phase. We've got offshore wind energy, which we've dedicated about 300 megawatts, representing about 10% of the entire energy mix. And that offshore wind energy is a very, very important piece you know, for a Tegwini municipality. We have been talking about oceans economy for some time, and um, we've been talking about you know, um, oceans current, we've been talking about developing the infrastructure in the, in the offshore. And therefore we believe that it is time that we entertain proposals that talks to offshore energy. And therefore we've got 10% allocated to that representing about 300 megawatts um, of the entire energy mix. We've got coal power, which is very controversial, I know, to some to think, um, why would anyone invest uh, to coal in today's age? And, you know, um, you, you see some lot of, lot of investment debated, you know, from coal to power. But our view is that if you travel KZN, if you travel to Ladysmith, you travel to Colonzo, you still have anthracite, which is a fantastic mineral resource that can be utilized um, to produce um, electricity within the province of Wazul Natal. And hence, we've got about 500 megawatts still allocated to coal power for the stability and for energy security for base of supply, it is very, very important for us that we still have coal investment um, within the country of South Africa. So therefore, we've got 17% of that energy mix allocated for coal power. We've got about 850 megawatts of energy allocated to natural gas. And I know some might say, but we have seen the prices of natural gas soaring you know, quite recently in Europe and what will be the impact um, to the consumers of the Tewini Metropolitan. But our view is that whatever that is happening in the Eastern Europe is just a temporary measure. Um, it's not a permanent situation. And, and, and most importantly, if you're based in Devon, you will know that we have got the infrastructure that is readily available uh, for natural gas. We consume methane-rich gas. The industrial gas demand is actually fulfilled by our methane-rich gas, which is transferred via the Lily pipeline. And of course, there are quite a number of technical issues there, but our view is that uh, you know, we are also investing quite more in the infrastructure. More importantly, Transnet is investing in the development of LNG import terminal in the Rijas Bay. And there are quite a number of discussions to say, how do we repurpose the Lily pipeline so that it can actually supplement what is that, that whatever that Transnet is doing in the Rijas Bay. So from the infrastructure point of view, we are very much happy that uh, we have got the infrastructure that is readily available. And therefore the molecules that are flowing within the infrastructure Maybe the problem, but we believe that uh, gas is available anywhere. I mean, you have got the Great King Central District, which is fast developing as a gas hub in the country. And our view is that Mozambique development will then play a very important role in terms of supplying those gas molecules um, within the province of Kwasuna. That it could be supplies via the FSRU, it could be supplies via ISO container. So there are quite a number of options that we can utilize in order to ensure that we've got all those gas molecules playing a very important role in our energy mix. So we've got about 850 megawatts allocated to gas to power, of which 300 megawatts 
is of course um, in the procurement phase um, that is sitting with National Treasury. And we believe that all of these projects are more likely going to come online um, by the year 2025, September 2025. If it is not September 25, 2025, it's more likely going to be um, around the first quarter of 2026. I mean, we remain optimistic about that. Um, I mean, because we are of the view that we'll be able to finalize the procurement process um, you know, before June um, next year, so hence, so that we can start the, the, the processes of construction and so forth and so forth. So we've got nuclear power represented by 940 megawatts representing 31% of our energy mix. So what you can see from this energy mix is that we have got a total demand sitting at around 3,000 megawatts. And I know some of the questions will be, um, what is the current electricity demand in the Chagun municipality? You know, but we have factored in the demand um, that is more likely going to grow in the near future. But most importantly, is that when we develop this energy mix, we don't develop it only for a Teguini municipality, but we are starting to grow the scope of a Teguini municipality to supply other nearby municipalities in the future. So our role is not going to be limited within a Teguini metropolitan, but we will start you know, supplying other municipalities also within the province of KwaZulu Natal. And that is a mandate that we are carrying. We have engaged with our provincial executive council with regards to that, and our view, we are being supported today to say a Teguini should not be seen as an only municipality that is growing, leaving secondary cities behind. And that is why we are engaging with our officials at the city of PMB. We are also engaging with our officials at the city of Mtlatuze. We are also engaging with the other officials at uh, Kwatabeba municipality, as well as at Ukuku district municipality. So, so there's a, a whole lot of developments that are that is happening within a Tewa municipality and our role and scope is more likely going to increase dramatically over the next few years going forward. As you can see that um, we have got 3,000 that we have also prepared that will procure from independent power producers. And we are also going to procure on behalf of other municipalities within the province of Wazul Natal. And that is why we've got this 3,000 megawatts going to 2035. So we've got this project that is sitting with Treasury right now is a 10 billion rand worth of private investment of which we are going to unlock as time goes by as soon as we get to those treasury views and and, and recommendation of course there's another element of section 34 ministerial determination of which we are going to work on um, as soon as we get those treasury reviews and recommendation we believe that is a process that could be fast track you know and could take anything between a month or two so we can get all those section 34 ministerial determination before the end of this year so those processes are more like we're going to be, you know, working in parallel as to try and, and, and ensure that uh, they are not causing any delays within the procurement. So that's what we have. So if you look at from the, you know, from the broader point of view, you will see that out of the entire energy mix, we've got about low carbon sources representing about 55%. And I'm talking about renewable energy and nuclear power included under that low carbon sources. And we've got fossil fuels represented by 40 so it's a balanced energy mix that will talk to job creation, that will talk to economic growth, that will talk to energy security um, of the country going forward. That will also respond, you know, to our Paris Agreement in terms of limiting and reducing the carbon emissions of the future. So that is what we have from our power generation mix of the Tegunia municipality. We've got 400 megawatts. That is already a capacity that is in the procurement phase. You know, I'm talking about the capacity that has been already determined the capacity that is sitting with national government of which we will then release an RFP very soon as soon as we receive those treasury reviews and recommendation. So last year when we released that RFP or that RFI into the market, we received an overwhelming support um, from local investors and international investors. As you can see that about 104 projects that we have received during that particular process representing about 16.5 gigawatts. And that is a massive scale. You know, and our view is that you can power the entire province of Wazun Natal together with Halting. Those are the first and second biggest economies in the country. So therefore, there's a massive potential in the country like South Africa. And in fact, we should be utilizing all of these opportunities in order to solve our energy crisis 
going forward. And we hope to attract about a 10 billion rand worth of investment, starting with this 400 megawatts. Obviously, is 100 megawatts of solar PV, which is roughly around 2.5 a billion rand in capital cost, and you've got about 300 megawatts of CCGT, which is a combined cyclic gas turbine with a capital investment of around um, 7.5 billion rand. So combined is around 10 billion rand. And we hope that we'll be able to create about 4,000 jobs um, during that particular process, starting in Q3 of 2023. Once we have got all the financial clause finalized, once we've got all the authorization finalized, of which I will talk more about the authorization over the next few slides. We're sitting at around 42% of local content based on all the proposals that we've received um, through our RFI last year. And we believe that it's a very fair level that one will achieve you know, if you look at the technology agnostic point of view, because when we release that RFI into the market, you know, we did not specify that it is 400 megawatts of which technology. It was more like a technology agnostic procurement where we have opened up for all technologies and hence we are sitting at around 42%. While there is a, a possibility that we can grow that local content um, towards 100%. More importantly, if you are dealing with a local procurement, it is expected that municipalities, most importantly metros, they should have a very strong local content um, specification as well as the requirements. And therefore, we are of the view that we should improve you know, from 42% all the way to 100%. I'm not sure whether that is achievable, especially if you look at you know, the, the recent announcement based on the presidential crisis plan um, to have the local content drastically reduced from 100% to about 35% um, in the country. And it, it, it also talks more about, you know, an opportunity for a country to invest more in the manufacturing base um, so that we can address all the demand you know, for renewable energy as well as other low carbon dispatchable power procurement uh, programs that we are going to embark on in the future. And another exciting element is that of having the equity funding transferred into a well-structured community trust. Obviously, when we unpacked the economic development compliance of the municipality, we will take into consideration all the funding mechanism. We will look in terms of what will be the stake of the community integration into the project. But of course, all those regulations, all those minimum and maximum thresholds will be determined by the Department of Trade and Industry and Competition because they are the custodian of that particular process. But we would like to see some community integrated projects um, within the energy sector. And we would like to see a hands-on working together between the private sector development side as well as the community uh, development side. So of, all of all, what we believe is that the transformation that is happening right now is a transformation of the people by the people and it must be um, structured in that manner um, going forward. If you look at our process flow diagram in terms of how is our procurement might actually look like in terms of the, um, the authorization that will be required you know, for different projects, different nature of projects, whether you talk about renewable energy, whether you talk about gas to power, whether you talk about nuclear power, whether you talk about call to power, our view is that um, you still need to get authorization and it is not an authorization that will be prepared by the municipality. You know, there are departments that has got authority to provide those authorization. When I talk about environmental impact assessment, they've got the Department of Environmental Affairs sitting within the province of Wazuma Natal. And the most important point that I want to emphasize is that since this is a local procurement by the Metropolitan, so it means that automatically the provincial government becomes an issuer of the environmental impact assessment. It's not going to be issued by national government. It will be issued by the provincial government. And it is not only about environmental impact assessment. It could include anything that has to do with major hazard installation. It could be include anything that has to do with agricultural concerns. It could be include anything that, used, that can do with building plan approvals and municipal bylaws. And those are the two elements that sits with municipality that we can that we can approve as soon as possible and things like ppp agreement is something that we're already working on so it, it, it it's a responsibility of the municipality and treasury as a something that we can approve as soon as possible things like um, um grid connection because depending of where the power generation infrastructure will be located um if it is 
if, if it is going to be integrated into the distribution network of the municipality, it means that the municipality will have to approve all those grid connections. So there are quite a number of authorization that will be required, um, but some of those authorization um, will be the responsibility of the municipality. So we are expected that you know the independent power producers they will have to factor in all of those authorization as part of our of their bidding process um, going forward or bidding proposal um, going forward. And once that process has been finalized, we will then have to go through the adjudication process of the municipality, the internal controls of the municipality, and then we can declare the preferred bidder or bidders. And then once that process is finalized, we will then negotiate the implementation agreement and the power pages agreement between whomever that has been recommended and the municipality, the issue of generation license seems to be not applicable anymore um, since that has been lifted, but it is subject to the um, a confirmation from the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy. But our view is that it may not be required, but we are yet to test that with the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy. So once we have finalized our power pages agreement, and that's where we can then begin to talk about issues of water use license, issues that talks to um, grid connection of the municipality, the budget code, whether it will be issued by the municipality or it will be issued by ESCOM. So those are the issues that we'll be talking about um, once we've got everything finalized under the power pages agreement, and then we'll work together with all the transitional advisors in order to ensure that for those that has been recommended, are able to reach the financial clause or final investment decision. And once that process is finalized, and then we can begin looking at the construction. Obviously, we are not expecting that all the IPPs that will be throwing the, the, the bidding um, proposals to the municipality that they will have achieved all of this authorization as part of the bidding process. Some authorization take time, so therefore, um, but they must demonstrate that um, you know, they've started the engagement with all those relevant departments in the future. We, we, we are of the view that our commercial operation date is more likely going to be uh, towards 2025. And hence, it is very important that um, the lead authorities in this case, which is the Department of Energy, they first track their own processes with regards to Section 34 ministerial determination. They are very much aware of what is coming to them. Treasury is also sitting on Treasury views and recommendations, section 20 of MFMA. COCTA has already issued the concurrence, and we've got ASIA, which is our economic development unit and, and, and tourism and environmental affairs, which is more likely going to issue things that talks to um, environmental impact assessment and all other authorizations that will be required. And we've engaged with those departments, and it has been mind it so that has been given to those departments coming from our provincial executive council to say we need to fast track all of these processes in order to ensure that we are able to get the authorizations as soon as possible and they are very much aware and and we hope that things like environmental impact assessment are more likely going to take about three months or even um, less than three months because they are actually I'm um, well aware of what is coming to them. So that has been communicated across to all spheres of this procurement process. And of course, the Tugun municipality is our off-taker in this point in time. So we will off-take that power based on our power pages agreement. So that's what we have at least from the process flow diagram in terms of how could our procurement plan um, could look like in the future. But what is important on our side is a social integration in terms of how do we ensure that we don't leave our people behind. As we transform and integrate IPPs into our mainstream economy, what is important on our side is to ensure that we don't leave our people behind. We develop this energy transformation for the people and by the people. And therefore, we need to ensure that we tick all the boxes of economic development compliance. We will look specifically in terms of job creation for local citizens, in terms of how many jobs will be created by each technology, and if the power generation infrastructure is located to a certain location. So immediate um, people that must be employed are those people that are actually um, located nearby the power generation infrastructure, power generation facility. So therefore, we will look at and stipulate what would be the minimum as well as the maximum threshold for that. Um, and of course, the Department of uh, Department of Trade, Industry and Competition is a custodian for that particular process. We will look closely in terms of the local content. I've already mentioned that it is expected that at a local government, the local content might be even much more stricter because we are dealing with the local um, government and hence local government must be seen you know, as advocating for manufacturing capability. So where are solar panels coming from? 
which company that manufactures solar panels, who transport the solar panels, who supply the steel, who actually does the operations, who does maintenance, who does the decommissioning of the plant, because we look at the life cycle operation of that particular power generation infrastructure. So the issue of local content will be the one that would be very, very crucial um, going forward. We need to invest more in the manufacturing base of the country in order to ensure that we cater for a demand that is more likely to grow in the future. Ownership of the infrastructure, that will be also taken into consideration. The management control of that power generation facility will then be taken into consideration in terms of the diversity of the management, whether you look at the board level, whether you look at an executive level, whether you look at senior management level in terms of the diversity, that will be also taken into consideration. But that will come as a part of the engagement between the municipality and whomever that would have been recommended as an IPP for the municipality going forward. On preferential procurement, we know that there is, a, there is a controversy at this point in time, but our view is that that is why we've got the legal advisors that will be actually dealing with this matter. And on the ent on enterprise and supply development, that will be very crucial going forward, especially in the environment that is actually complex. You know, energy sector is one of the very complex sectors that we have in the country. We would like to see small emerging enterprises participating in our procurement process. We would like to see women-owned vendors participating in our local, in our procurement process as the way of trying to sort of like skill transfer in the way, but at the same time learning or empowerment um, in the energy transformation sector. And that is why our radical economic transformation policy is in the center of our economic development compliance. And hence, it is very important that um, in the future, we have some small emerging companies participating in the energy sector. Chair, in closing, this is an end of my presentation, but I would like to take you through to our anticipated timelines in terms of uh, actually having the concurrence process and section 34 determination. We hope that could be finalized in October. Uh, 2022, we already received some concurrences. We are left with Treasury as well as uh, Section 34 ministerial determination. Of course, October uh, is, is next month. Perhaps maybe we may be behind the schedule or so. National Treasury dispatching advisors, uh, we are already behind the schedule. We are waiting for the outcome of National Treasury. We will then start formulating the RFP documentation in September. We are also behind the schedule there. And once we have all the transitional advisors with municipality, we will then start uh, preparing the RFP documentation of which it will be released um, either in November or December this year. And we'll have bidders conference in around December or January 2023. And we've got a bid submission deadline in around March, March 2023. So what you can see is that the period between the release of RFP and the period between the submission deadline of RFP. So we are going to give potentially the IPPs around four to five months, you know, because we understand that there's quite a lot of authorizations that will be required by the IPPs in order to ensure that they develop a quality proposal that will meet all the requirements set by the municipality um, going forward. We'll announce the preferred bidders um, in May 2023, and then we'll have a deadline for financial clause in September 2023. And of course, our commercial operation date will be in September 2025. So this is our anticipated timeline, provided that we get all the authorization um, from different spheres of government on time. So probably we will have the commercial operation in September 2025. If it does not happen, so be it. We still have time to deal with 2026. So thanks very much, Chair. And I'm very much here to take some of your questions at the end of my presentation. Thanks very much, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Um... Uh, Sibu, and uh, thank you for the detailed uh, presentation and the uh, information that you've shared with us. It was a technical, but on the other side, you've uh, assisted uh, assisted us with the processes that one will have to follow to actually um, cover the work that uh, Tegwini has uh, done. I'm sure there's also other municipalities connected, engineers also connected, and uh, there's a long list of questions and that Dr. Stevens will also um, help us to take some of um, the, the questions. Maybe while we're handing over to uh, Dr. Stevens, it's quite interesting that I've uh, just taken a note on your uh, on the uh, Tequini plan, the energy independence uh, by 2050. 
this is quite an interesting plan and i think it's really a net zero um 2050 uh, um uh, adop adoption already that i can note here maybe maybe while we're taking through some of the questions uh, one of the questions that i have it's more on the tariff to say what does that, this mean to our current tariff structure i'm assuming that obviously as customers will have um, a flexibility to choose between uh, the different types of supply and i'm hoping that um, maybe very soon we might be also getting one of um, your members to share more details on that uh, on um, you know the different options that we we'll have in terms of the supply and what does it mean to our tariff structures as as uh, your customers and also more on the residential side how do the uh, residential a sector benefit from um, these uh, plans that you have as as a tech win. Surely the 3000 megawatts is quite a big um, capacity that uh, you've projected for as a city. But uh, yeah, they, it was very, very interesting. Thank you so much, Sibu. Uh, I would like to introduce um, Dr. Stevens. I think uh, I'm sure there are a few questions there. Over to you, uh, Dr. Stevens. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, I think uh, one of the questions deals with um, with the tariffs and, and the guarantees. But the first one was uh, from Brian, um, who, who thought that municipalities are automatic IPPs. In other words, that you did not really have to go through the whole rigmarole of approvals um, that you've indicated. Uh, what is the what is the role of the of the of the Munich? Um, obviously, uh, the, the they seem to be uh, subject to the same uh, regulations as 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 others is there, is there any fast track uh, uh in that regard uh, Sibu, you can answer <clears throat> thank you uh, thanks very much uh, dr stephen um i guess the question is about the role of municipality and there was a suggestion to say we we didn't have to go through to all these uh, processes, but the fact of the matter is that municipalities are still highly regulated in South Africa. There is absolutely no way that you can actually skip some of these processes, especially when you talk about private um, public partnership model and the external service delivery mechanisms. You have got to ensure that you comply with Section 76B of Municipal Systems Act. You have got to ensure that you comply with Section 120 of MFMA, you know, so so municipalities are still very much highly regulated in the country, and in as much as even Section 34 ministerial determination, you still need to do it. You know, there is there is there is no way that the minister may just issue Section 34 without testing the financial standing of the municipality. I think that's where the issue of guarantees also um, come into consideration to say, you know, um, how do we ensure that municipalities, um, the issue of guarantees by municipalities is also, you know, uh, taken into consideration. So the fact of the matter is that, you know, the issue of guarantees um, is, is, is actually not a pressing issue per se, because um, the municipalities, they can guarantee themselves. You know, there's an, a provision under Section 48 of the Municipal Finance Management Act, and there's a provision under Section 150, under Section 50 of the Municipal Finance Management Act, in which it actually stated very clear that the municipalities, they can guarantee themselves. So there's no need to go to Treasury and look for guarantees, you know, and our view is that a financially healthy municipality, just like that of a Chagunu municipality, that have received some positive credit ratings in 2021 shouldn't have any problems, you know, for for investors because it's a very very financially healthy municipality, you know, in South Africa. And uh, the question also um, was about from you, um, Mr. Nkosi, was about the tariff structure um, in terms of how is that is going to be managed, you know, how are the residential customers going to be impacted? You know, I know that. Um, when you when you procure from your, from the new generation um, infrastructure, you know sometimes we tend to compare and benchmark this with an old generation infrastructure. It's like to say I want to buy a new BMW, but I want to benchmark with the price of an old BMW. So it does not make any sense, isn't it? So what is very important on our side is that as we buy from the new generation facilities, obviously the price may be a little bit higher than your megaflex tariffs that you buy from ESCOM. But that is going to be even much more better in the long run, simply because these IPP 
contracts are increasing in line with inflation. So they don't, they, 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 they increase in line with inflation, unlike ESCOM tariffs, which are actually increasing far above inflation. So even if you start with an expensive price, but in the long term, that expensive price may be, you know, the one that will be less cheaper, you know, going forward. I mean, what is very important here is the life cycle cost. It's not the cost from today's market, but it's a, it's a life cycle cost over time. So that's what will be very important going forward. But from the renewable energy perspective, you might have seen the bit window number five um, from the DMRE to say we had the cheapest at around 47 cents a kilowatt hour. That was the cheapest one, obviously non-dispatchable, but it was the cheapest at around 47 cents. If you compare that with what you buy from ASCOM, so it's far cheaper. You know, provided that is producing electricity. I know that sometimes we tend to compare this tariff, but obviously the other one is dispatchable and the other one is non-dispatchable. But even if you factor in all the controls of trying to make the non-dispatchable dispatchable, dispatchable um, we have seen um, in the risk mitigation that um, you know the price of about 180 cents a kilowatt hour for battery storage, of which it wasn't so expensive if you look at the prices you know for battery storage in the market right now it is fast declining and our view is that battery will play a very important role in terms of stability of the energy supply in the country and indeed we also encourage that for all utility scale projects that will be built in the city they must they must be integrated into a battery and storage in order to make them dispatchable over time so I thought, Chair, I've answered some of your questions. Thank you. Uh, th thank you. Uh, yes, in fact, I think you've answered um, a few of them that have come up. The next one was de dealing with guarantees, um, but I think you've, you've covered that. Uh, will uh, Etiquini afford IPP guarantees as afforded by DMRE IPP projects within the RSA sovereign guarantees? I think you have answered that, that the Munich is in fact in the position to issue guarantees. Um, the next one was, which I think you expected, was what is your peak demand? Um, at the moment in 2021, you are looking at about 3,000 megawatts. Uh, in, in the future, are you around about 2.3 or 2.2 or two, two at the moment? Hey, Chair, thanks very much for that. Um, yeah, the, the, the peak demand that we're working on, in fact, it's also part of our integrated resource plan was around 1,700 megawatts. As I've already mentioned, that um, we, 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 we develop all these strategic reforms for the future. Obviously, you, can plan, you, you cannot plan for a decline in the economy. We should always plan for a positive economic growth in the future. And that is why we have that 3,000 megawatts over time. And I've also mentioned the fact that our scope is not going to be limited within a Tegunia municipality, but our scope will be also reaching other municipalities outside the boundary of a Tegunia municipality. So hence, the 3,000 megawatts that we have is a 3,000 megawatts of new additional capacity over time. It's not the 3,000 megawatts in today's, you know, so it's the 3,000 megawatts that will be procured in the future. Obviously, the demand of a Chagun municipality by the year 2050 or so, we expect to be around 2,500, somehow around that, that, that figure. But obviously, um, that would also um, you know, take into consideration the fact that the demand from other municipalities um, would also play a very important role. As I've already mentioned, that um, our scope is not to look at a Tegun municipality alone, but it's also to look and become a procurer on behalf of other municipalities within the province of Wazul Natal. And hence, I was mentioning the point about our engagement with the city of PMD, Umsunduzi municipality, our engagement with city of Mlatuze, our engagement with city of Newcastle, our engagement with city of Ugatuguza. All of those municipalities are more likely going to procure power from independent power producers, and we have engaged with them. And their, our role is that we should become a multi-scheme buyer where we become a procurer on behalf of other municipalities. And that we have also um, you know, um, engaged with our provincial executive council to issue, you know, to better understand the issue of boundaries and how are we going to work with that um, going forward. And I think the most important point here, Stephen, is that um, the location of the power generation infrastructure, our first priority is that it should be within a table municipality. But we also understand that if you start investing in things like solar PV utility scale projects, 
um, you are challenged when it comes to land. Land is actually becoming a constraint, and that is why we say solar PV, there's a big issue around power density, and as a result of that, um, you've got to take that into consideration, and hence maybe you may need to build that infrastructure outside your boundary, elsewhere, maybe in the province of Wazul Natal. We've got about 11 districts in total in the province of Wazul Natal, and in fact, any plant could be located anywhere as a second option. But our preference is that, you know, the first option has to be within the boundary of Tegwin, but should that become a problem, we then have to look at other districts within the province of Guazul Mata. Excellent, excellent, thank you. Um, the next one is, uh, will there be a dedicated teams in KZN Environmental Affairs that deal uh, with the applications for EIAs with regard to new bills? that may be coming through, as this might be a bottleneck uh, in the process. I, I can definitely sympathize with that one. Are, are you having dedicated EIA teams um, to assist the IPPs? Definitely, we will be um, assisted with regards to that. And we've engaged that with our Provincial Executive Council. And um, I think the most important thing here is not to delay investors, it's not to cause frustration um, to the investors, it's to ensure that we speed up the process in order to get those EIAs as soon as possible. So yes, indeed, there will be the team that will be dealing, in fact, that will be working with us. In fact, we are coordinating the establishment of the steering committee that will be working with the municipality as well as the, the provincial government in order to ensure that we speed up that particular process. In fact, our time frame is that we should be able to, you know, to have EIAs in less than three months. There should be no reason of why we should not have EIAs in less than three months. So that is our target, really, um, because we want to ensure that we reach the commercial operation date on time and so that we can start building for another next batch. You know, this is a first batch that we're talking about, but there will be another batch. Obviously, there will be quite a number of procurements that will be doing in the future, as you can see from our energy transformation plan, to say we start with 400 megawatts, but in the future, we're going for 3,000 megawatts. So next year, 2023, we will start another batch. So we don't want to have delays along the pipeline because the issue of the energy crisis in South Africa is not going to end anytime soon. So we've got to ensure that for us, in order to decouple from the national grid and become self-sufficient by the year 2050, we've got to ensure that our procurement pipeline is designed in such a way we are able to deal with all other EIAs and all other authorizations that will be required during the project development. Uh, excellent. That that sounds a, a very um, uh, ambitious uh, target. So if we can get that right, I think that would be that would be a really really big step forward. And I think uh, we could learn from that process if you get that right. Um, the the next three questions are, are all linked. Uh, it's from uh, Gary Fontaine. Uh, I just want to know: uh, Will you have for the RFP? Will you have a grid network and loading uh, released? In other words, so that that we can we ensure the uh, connection costs from the RPP to the grid is actually kept as a minimum. Um, so that we don't have to do a lot of grid strengthening to, to uh, incorporate the RPP. And then linked to that is, um, does a municipality have any, any land that's available or can be procured uh, for the sites? And uh, is there any then uh, similar to that? Is there, will the Munich make available any land that they own? which might be suitable uh, for an IPP. Thanks very much for that uh, statement. I think, let me start with the one that talks to grid strengthening. And I think what is very important on our side and, and is primarily one of the reasons why we need to have transitional advisors. Remember, the energy function you know, is, is something which is very much new to the local government. You know, it's not that the thing that we have been doing for some for some for, for, for some years. And and our view is that that is why we need to have a technical advisors that will be working with the city around where do you connect this power generation infrastructure and what will be the evocation capacity in our substations and how do we do it in a safely manner that is actually also in compliance with the grid code. So all of those technicalities 
of how do you then operate the grid under that environment will then be outlined um, in, the, in, in the future. Obviously, when we issued out an RFP into the market, we will have something which is similar to ESCOM, which we call the generation capacity assessment, which will then have to look at each and every substation of the municipality to say, for this particular substation, we've got so much capacity that is available. And for this particular substation, we've got so much capacity available. And that particular document will form part of an RFP uh, process going forward. But all technicalities that has to do with an operation of the grid, you know, the backflow and all those kind of uh, frequency regulations will then have to be addressed um, by technical advisors. Obviously, they'll be working with our electricity unit, which then becomes the buyer in this case because in our energy transition policy um, we have structured the function in such a way they don't contradict to each other and um, there is no duplication of efforts and that is why I report as I'm based within the energy department and my role is to procure any new additional capacity. I do what the Department of Mineral Resources is doing at national government, whereas on the other side, we have got electricity unit, which is then the primary um, entity that is responsible for the operations of the grid um, going forward. So, so those are the kind of um, actually uh, technical issues that will then have to outline when we have all of those um, transitional advisors within the municipality. So it's a first batch for the municipality, and we just have to treat it as such. The second question was about the land availability and whether or not the municipality will be able to make land. In fact, all the land that is on the, by, by the municipality, uh, we will support for any economic activity, any economic activity that has to do um, with power generation or any other project, you know, we will support for that. So indeed, if the land of the municipality is the most productive land that will be identified by the by the investors, we are more likely going to engage with those investors um, through the PPP model. And that is why when we've made that application for TVR1 to the National Treasury, um, we have made it through Section 120 because we, have, um, we understand that there could be some investors that may want to build the power generation infrastructure on the land that is owned by the municipality. So indeed, yes, if there is a, a project that wants to build or any investor that wants to build infrastructure on the land that is owned by a municipality, we will engage with them through our PPP process. But should it happen that the investors choose to build the land in the private land, choose to build the infrastructure on the private land, we will be more than happy um, as well. I mean, that's another option that is available to them. So we will not uh, criticize such a move, obviously, um, at the end of the day is a matter of electrons. We want to ensure that we have dispatchable electrons all the time so that we can mitigate the impact of load sharing to the municipality. Thank you. Uh, excellent. Thank you. Uh, there is a question here as well as to why you do not specifically have storage in your program. You did mention that you uh, wanted the um, IPPs to be dispatchable. So under the solar, are you asking for a dispatchable component which would include storage? I presume for gas, et cetera, you wouldn't need the storage. It would be for the renewables and the wind. Well, wind and wind and uh, wind and solar. Yeah. Yeah, no, thanks very much for that, um, Dr. Stefan. Once again, storage is not an energy source. Um, as, as the name says, um, it's, it's, it's a storage mechanism. It's not an energy source. So, it's, so that is why it's not included in our transformation plan. But obviously, when we issued out an RFP into the market, there will be projects that will require energy storage, and there will be projects that will not require energy storage. You know, for example, for solar PV, um, there are projects that will be earmarked for rooftop solar PV on government buildings. You know, so those solar PV um, projects may, may not require any energy storage, but for utility scale projects such as solar PV on build on land, um, those projects and, and, and of course integrated into the grid, those projects are more likely going to require um, energy storage. So, so obviously um, we, will, we will assess every proposal, we will draft the specification for that, but um, in responding to your question, Storage is, is very much important, although it's not included in our, in our energy transformation plan, simply because it's not an energy source. So therefore, it's like to say hydrogen. Hydrogen is not an energy source, but it's an energy carrier. So, so, so therefore, there could be quite a number of technology advancements happening under energy storage. It may not be always about battery storage. It could be 
energy storage in the form of hydrogen as well. So, so our view is that um, it's not included because it's not an energy source, but obviously when we start issued out those RFP into the market, there will be projects that will require energy storage um, in order to make them dispatchable on demand and also to, in order to make them be always available um, on demand. So therefore, um, there will be other projects that will not require um, energy storage, but obviously that will be determined by in terms of how are you going to manage your grid um, in the in the future. So maybe those projects may be balanced by natural gas. I don't know at this point in time. We haven't had any any proposal from different investors. We haven't even started drafting the specification. So, but yeah, our view is that every source has got a role to play in our energy transformation plan. Oh, excellent. I think that's a good approach uh, to have a uh, not only a, a, a dispatchable, um, but also if you can get synchronous generators on on board to avoid your duck curve effect and the um, uh, also the lack of inertia on your grid. Um, so this uh, sounds like you're doing the right thing there. Um, there's a question from Basu Chetty just asking: Will IPPs be restricted uh, to KZN? Um, you did mention the geographic location um uh, is there anything for example if it's in uh, uh, eastern cape uh, just other side of the border would that be accepted or is it uh, geographically limited to kzn definitely it is going to be um limited to to the province of kwazulu natal and and one of the reason why we're doing this um is to ensure that we 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 rapidly industrialize the economy of this province and at the same time, you will know that the province of KwaZulu Natal, as I've already mentioned in my slide, that is a province that is very, very much lacking behind when it comes to energy infrastructure investment. And as a result of that, we believe that every power generation infrastructure should be located within the province of KwaZulu Natal. And in fact, within Etekuni municipality as a first option and as a, as a second option within the province of KwaZulu Natal. And that's what we have in order to ensure that we create job opportunities within the province of KwaZulu Natal. We minimize the electrical losses within the province of KwaZulu Natal. And we also procure on behalf of other municipalities within the province of KwaZulu Natal. This is just to ensure that we are able to respond to our economic recovery. I'm sure that you know that uh, we've been facing the COVID crisis for some time. We've been facing the crisis, the, the, the issue of floods. And therefore, it is very important that the energy infrastructure is viewed and classified as a catalyst for economic growth within the province of Kwazulu Natal. And hence, that is why we say that power generation infrastructure, even if we can build 17 power plants, all of those power plants should be available within the province of Kwazulu Natal. Maybe another reason it will be around the grid capacity availability. I'm sure that you have also mentioned that through the what ESCOM has released in the GCA generation capacity assessment, you will see that the province of Kwazulu Natal has got more than 6,000 megawatts of grid capacity that is already available. So it will make those projects be connected much more cheaper on the grid um, as opposed to other provinces, especially those that are located on the southern southern cluster of the country. Now, good, good, good points. Um, thank you. The next question is from our colleague. Uh, Pat Naidu, um, he just says, have you explored in your planning the opportunities of promoting a deeper nexus or collaboration between electricity and water? For example, your 940 watt megawatt nuclear can serve uh, for electricity generation, desalination for water and hydrogen production for transportation and shipping. So in other words, it's not just for uh, energy, um, electrical energy, as well as uh, all the rest of the stuff you need for, to ride the grid, but also for um, other things such as deceleration and hydrogen production. Has that been looked into or is that taken as an, as an additional uh, uh, benefit? Absolutely. Um, I'm sure that you might have seen our energy transition policy uh, chair when I was presenting across all, all, across all the energy consumption pattern. I started with the power sector transformation and I said we are also looking at optimizing our transport transition in the form of you know, trying to look at the uptake of electric vehicles, but that would require that we have a modernized grid. But at the same time, I've also mentioned 
the industrial transformation in the pulp and paper, petrochemical sector, the chemical industry as a whole. Um, you, you can also mention cement industry. You know, so 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 the hydrogen economy strategy um, that we have just recently developed, in fact, is the first of its kind in the country um, that that could look and quantify the the, the hydrogen demand um, in, within the province of KwaZulu Natal, but also you know model. Wow, how is that demand going to look like in the 2040, um, in, in 2050? And I think what is important is that, you know, we are going to de decarbonize the transport sector ut utilizing hydrogen in the so-called FCEVs, um, you know, cars. We are going to de decarbonize the industrial sector looking at, you know, utilizing hydrogen as a feedstock. I mean, Deben is located, um, or we've got two crude oil refineries um, located here in Deben. And those crude oil refineries, they collectively contribute about 57% uh, to the liquid fuel industry. Supreferon is a 180,000 barrels per day, and engine alone is around 130,000 barrels per day. So if we can utilize hydrogen during in those processes, and I know that there's a controversy with regards to those crude oil refineries, but what is important is that we know where is the demand for hydrogen. And I think we have, made, we have raised a very important point about desalination in terms of how do we then um, convert you know, the ocean's water into drinkable water. I think that's where we are heading, and that's where hydrogen strategy will then play a very important role there in terms of how do we then convert that um you know um you know oceans oceans water into drinkable water utilizing the reverse osmosis and that would be a crucial economic activity you know for a technical municipality and of course our view is that in the long term because the desalination is an energy intensive process and we've got to look at how can we power that utilizing offshore wind? And we are in the process of establishing the so-called the South Devon Energy and Chemicals Park, of which will then integrate all these um, you know, sectors of economy into one big hydrogen cluster. And that you will hear about it when we release our regional hydrogen strategy before the end of this year. And because that is a strategy that is built um, to ensure that we integrate the Tequini district as well as the King Kajal district as a way of trying to transform that into strategic corridor um, within the hydrogen economy space. So there's a whole lot of uh, thinking around the regional hydrogen strategy. So we're looking at the synthetic fuel, the production of sustainable innovation fuel. We're looking at you know establishing the refueling infrastructure for hydrogen. But you will hear more when we release that uh, regional hydrogen strategy in the future. But there's a whole lot of strategic projects that we are going to execute in the future. Uh, thank you. It looks like your your planning has been very holistic, and uh, as a resident of Etiquini, I'm I'm very encouraged about this. And maybe Prof. Pat Naidu will consider coming back to Durban after this. Um, moving ahead, though, um, <laughs> the uh, the there's a question here as well. The 300 megawatt for offshore wind, it, uh, 300 megawatt wind, is that offshore? only or are you looking at onshore and i presume the offshore will be on floating platforms absolutely absolutely chair um it's 300 megawatts for offshore wind only um we are trying to respond back to operation pakisa chair um, we, we 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 have been talking about oceans economy for some time but if, if you look at the track record nothing is happening there so so therefore we should start investing around the offshore wind and and you know we are very much happy because you know um, there was some quite a number of studies that has been done um, and seems to indicate that we've got a great wind resources offshore as opposed to onshore i mean we have had some you know proposal for onshore but i think i'm um, safe to say um, the province of KwaZulu Natal generally is not good when it comes to onshore wind resources, but more specifically, a Teguini municipality. I'm not going to say other districts um, within the province of KwaZulu Natal are like a Teguini, but the most pressing matter is that we've got to deal with the ocean's economy. So we don't have any megawatts allocation for onshore at this point in time. Maybe we may have in the future. It's just that at this point in time, we are very much not convinced that there is any great wind resources on shore um, within the Tegunia municipality. But of course, that is why we choose for go for 
for, for offshore wind resources because there seems to be an evidence um, to say there is a greater wind resources offshore. Of course, that we've got to deal with environmental issues and then I'm sure that uh, some environmentalists, uh, they will start to hate me now um, because uh, we will have to implement these projects under the umbrella of oceans economy. Uh, good, good point. Now that, that makes sense. Um, th that concludes the questions. There's one further that um, has been put on by an attendee um, and it just says, will this recording be made available? Well, yes, if you go to the chat, uh, box, you'll see there that uh, Minx has actually put up um, a, a, a whole lot of things that you can access. So um, the the uh, YouTube um, channel, um, SATV channel on YouTube, will will um, host this uh, webinar, and uh, you can see the, uh, the 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 YouTube link, but they'll wide S I I E T V. Um, and you can get this webinar as soon as it is uploaded, whether you attended this uh, webinar or not. So the, the full recording there is available. And um, also, of course, you can download the latest What Now issue, which deals with lightning, um, which is quite, uh, quite appropriate coming into summer. Um, and uh, uh, there, there's also um, other, uh, other interesting bits there. Um, so uh, with that, uh, Sabu, I'd like to thank you very much for answering the questions and your presentation. And I'd now like to hand back to, to, to Minx and, and Shepard just for uh, a final uh, close down. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Stevens. Thank you also to uh, Mr. Spoon, Jalin Shalia Konke with you, uh, Dr. Stevens. Um, yeah, it was a very good uh, presentation, uh, Sabu and uh, you've actually used all the airtime questions were flying left right and center and also thank you to the attendees uh, it was uh, the information was well received from the questions that uh, we've received after the presentation thank you to to everyone and just to add on one what dr stevens indicated we also have a handout uh, from our discussion uh, um, today there's already our saie uh, what's now a uh, magazine that's available you can actually get it from uh, the invitation there's already uh, it's attached to our um, webinar this afternoon we also can download the saie training academy brochure that's also available and as uh, dr stevens indicated so the presentation will also be made available thank you to everyone and uh, the webinar is closed enjoy your afternoon Thank you, Chair. Thank you.